Hello and welcome everyone to another chess lecture brought to you, <coughs> excuse me, brought to you by chess.com and uh, FM Daniel Wrench. Uh, today what uh, we are going to be doing is continuing our discoveries and continuing our journey on the road of principle of two weaknesses. Um, and uh, we're getting toward the end here in terms of covering all the different fundamental ideas, all the different psychological points, all the different um, just really good practical approaches to have in, in, your, in your game and in your mindset when you're trying to convert small advantages, which is kind of what the whole theme is. I'm, when you're talking about principle of two weaknesses, you're talking about positions where, you know, as you see on the board here, um, positions where you have an advantage, um, but it's not so easy, whether it be because your opponent has a nice blockade, which we've seen in some of the videos, or here you see because maybe your opponent has a decent amount of counterplay. Obviously, having the A-pawn is, is a very strong asset, but if you're only relying on the A-pawn, it may not be good enough um, for a few reasons. One being maybe maybe his rook can hold just by simply coming back behind the pawn. Um, also, you have to make sure that when it comes to a raised position, that you can afford to lose your H3 pawn, um, and that your A-pawn will indeed be quicker than his pawn. So, <clears throat> these are all little factors we're taking in when looking at this position. Um, and we, we're calling this uh, particular video lecture um, Advanced Execution, and that's because what we're trying to show is that the, the second weakness can be a number of things. Um, when we started out, we were talking very simply in terms of, okay, here's one major obvious advantage, and you know, here's an obvious advantage over here. Now let's just convert it. And then, and then it got a little bit more difficult, which was, okay, we have a huge obvious advantage, um, but there's a blockade, and so we have to at least create some targets or create some threats so that the blockade is broken down, and then we can execute. Um, but as the positions go on, it, it gets trickier and trickier, and so here we're seeing a position where you have an advantage, obviously, in the A-pawn. However, the A-pawn alone may not be good enough um, for the reasons I just pointed out, either the H-pawn being taken or the A-pawn um, being stopped by the rook coming behind it. Um, and also, just it's not even so easy to find a second weakness. Um, what, what is interesting to note is um, <clears throat> if we were to, let's say, make some random move here, I just want to talk about the position. If, if this, if this uh, black rook was over in front, of the pawn. Um, black would be at a disadvantage not only because his rook isn't as active, um, but because without without the threats of counterplay, um, white is free to do as he pleases, whether that be choosing over here or over here and try to create a second weakness um, or, or easily win that second pawn. Um, and, and so even, even if black ends up losing this game, I think black took the right approach in trying to bring his rook back behind to attack the h3 pawn or, or create um, his toughest defense possible, which is typically with the rook behind the pawn. Um, <clears throat> so that's just good to note that the, I think black did choose the right approach. Now, already we're in a position where I would suggest you maybe take a moment to think about what white should play here. Um, I'll try to make a move here to uh, just kind of reset, refresh things here. So why, why don't you think about what's going on here and, and see if you can tell me uh, what white should do to get this, get this party started. Um, because I think this is the, this is one of the most critical moments where you have to not only calculate um, Black's threat of winning the H pawn combined with your pushing of the A pawn, uh, but also you have to uh, you have to make sure that if you can push that pawn um, and he comes back behind it, where your plan is going to be, where the second weakness is going to be in Black's position. Um, and I, I particularly like this endgame because to me the second weakness is, is not so obvious, um, not such an easy thing to, to realize. So go ahead and take a moment. Okay, and we're going to assume that you did. And uh, so White White did calculate here and find the most accurate approach, which was to play a5. And um, surprisingly, this move can be played because after Rook takes h3, um, not necessarily because you you would push. Um, if you push, Black Black has a couple of moves. One of them being Bishop to d5. And after check and the King moves, you're already in a situation where. Um, Black's Black's threats Black Black's threats even if he has to sack the piece with the extra pawn here is creating enough counterplay to to at least be controversial um, not something we really want to create in fact <coughs> G5 may be may be considered here um, by Black uh, but the real reason being that the the White has the extremely accurate Rook takes E6 
and after king takes e6, a6 is played, and, and you'll see that uh, black doesn't have enough time to come back around um, to uh, stop the pawn from queening, and, and by the time he gets over and sacrifices his rook, this should be an easily winning endgame for white because this is a, uh, a knight pawn or a g pawn, not a corner pawn. Um, although it would be good to note that if you were dealing with a position where this was a corner pawn, the result here would be a draw because the bishop is the wrong color corner. Um, and so I don't know. This isn't a, uh, a bishop ending, or we're not we're not covering you know theoretically drawn endgames today. But just always good to keep that in mind. I, I always find it useful when you can try to think ahead um, in the position like we talked about in our previous lectures, which is this building a bridge calculation. Make sure you don't just stay focused on the I go there, he goes there that's in front of you. Always make sure that as the exchanges and the pieces come off the board, that you are indeed headed toward a position that's better for you. Kind of see the bigger picture. I think sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle, and then people find themselves in an endgame, and they're like, oh, what the heck happened, right? And they realize that it was their own doing. Um, okay, so white played a5, which is an x clam, uh, because black cannot take the h3 pawn, because again, rook takes e6, wins immediately. And it's possible that a6 right away might win too, but it was a little bit trickier, so rook takes e6 was the most straightforward. Um, so indeed, black played rook back behind the pawn, rook a2, which forces white to guard the pawn with rook e5. And now black comes up king of six, and we're already in a position where um, another critical decision needs to be made. Um, to me, this is actually the most critical point in the game in terms of our, our theme, which is principle of two weaknesses. Um, the beginning of the game, I was just trying to, you know, kind of give you some sort of foreshadowing about, you know, the ideas we're thinking about, remind you of what we talked about before, um, and, and, you know, clarify for you that... Um, even in a principle of two weaknesses position, you have to calculate, which is what White did, and that's why he was able to play a5. Um, if you were always playing cautious moves, you wouldn't have played a5. Um, but anyway, so once you reach this position, now this is really critical, because um, the move that was played in the game by White um, is, is sort of an obvious move. It looks standard in terms of, all right, I'm going to safeguard my rook, bring my rook over, I'm still defending the pawn, and now I should have plenty of time to try to figure out what else to do here to create some problems in black position. Um, but believe it or not, after rook c5, um, black played an exclam move, which is rook a3 check, with the idea being that on king f4, if king f4 is played, g5 check can be played anyway, because on rook takes g5, black has rook takes f3. So after rook a3 check, White played king to e2, and black played g5 anyway, and all of a sudden, just just the, the sheer fact that he was able to, to connect these pawns, provide some protection, um, black went on to draw this game, actually, pretty easily, in fact, because, you know, just answer me this, um, how does the rook improve his situation without losing protection of the pawn? Well, the only way to do that would be to attack the rook, but let's say even if you were somehow able to bring the king over here, without losing protection of the bishop or maybe the pawn on, G2, on h3, which I don't even think it's possible. But even if you did, um, rook a2 check, which is protected by the bishop, followed by back to a3 check, you know, it seems like black is going to have um, enough defense to really hold his, 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 uh, his clamp down on the a-pawn. And uh, white was unable to win. He was, he was unable to create a second weakness. And um, because of that, um, you should note that king e4 would pretty much be the same story, um, if not for the fact that black can actually just give check and repeat. Even g5 here, we're sort of in a similar scenario where the king cannot run over based on the, the loss of protection of the bishop. The bishop can hardly move because of the pawn, and the rook can hardly move because he loses protection of this pawn. So this game was actually quickly agreed to a draw. Because white played a very natural move, ask yourselves that, how many of you would naturally slide the rook over from protection um, and instead of having to calculate ideas where the king comes up and it looks a little bit hairy, um, how many of you would quickly move the rook over? Seems like you're guarding the fifth rank and you're, you're doing the right thing to keep an eye on the pawn, but end up drawing the game because of this move. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and it should be noted that, that probably g5 right away, the reason why it's not as good right away um, is... is there's a couple things here, um, but just the fact that uh, you lose the ability to, to get, you didn't give the check right away, if, if white were, uh, excuse me, if white were to bring the bishop to b7 very quickly, and you were to go after this pawn on h3, now the pieces are in more of an optimal position to get a queen very quickly. Um, and so I think that white would go on to win there. So, but by, by giving the check on, on a3 first, and then playing g5, um, 
he, he put the king in a little bit more of a passive position, and after bishop to b7 is played, um, the pawn would be taken, and then this pawn would actually be taken with check, and there you're dealing with a situation where if black has two passed pawns, even, even the loss of the rook, which may not happen, let's take a quick look. But even the loss of the rook, which may not happen because the rook is holding the dark square, uh, may be okay because, I mean, when these two pass pawns get going here, um, depending on how much time it takes white to queen the A pawn, um, black obviously has sufficient counterplay. Um, and, and again, you know, obviously we could look at this, this for a very long time and you could try to calculate it. Any of you guys sitting at home and trying to find... Um, problems with Danny Wrench's analysis, you may be able to turn on Ribka and figure figure out something where I, I alluded to something quickly. But overall, I know my analysis is accurate because I've, I've done it with the computer. So, you know, just take, take a chill pill, buddy. Um, but also, not even that. I mean, to me, it's almost irrelevant because what we're trying to talk about here is, is a practical... Um, is a practical skill, which is which is sometimes the exact calculation of the X's and O's and how you figure out how to make progress. In fact, a lot of times it is. But principle of two weaknesses is more of a practical point where, you know, just the fact that White was allowing that type of counterplay and reaching that position, especially when you consider the time pressure and the things that go in there, it's just the wrong approach. And what we're trying to talk about is, is how we can approach our games with allowing our opponent the most limited amount of counterplay and, and, and improve our position position very clearly, not like with a hope chess in mind, or not because he blundered later, but but have a clear second weakness, even if it's not the most accurate win that Ripka found very quickly, the, the ideas are very, very, um, you know, very influential in your game, because it's like, you're, you're approaching it from, from a point of view that even if you don't calculate accurately all the time, you can, you can apply principle of two weaknesses every time. The point is that if you have the patience and the discipline to set some goals, do this building a bridge calculation where you're trying to see the bigger picture on a regular basis, and, and keeping in mind that you do need to create a second target. You know, it's like you can you can calculate, a, you know, a little bit less accurately in those cases because you are winning, because you are better, and your opponent's in a bad position. So, again, I just wanted to say that, that you know, um, it's important that when you uh, when you think about these uh, these positions and you learn from these video lectures that you keep that in mind. You know, we're looking at some really good, accurate ways to – in, to uh, improve and then win um, a slightly better position. And uh, sometimes there's crazy variations that we could look at here, but we're not going to. Um, okay, sorry for that little rambling. But now that we're back to the point, um, the point is that White played king f4, which is an excellent. I mean, the key is that he can play this move now because black can't play g5. In the other position, if the rook was already on a3, g5 check could be played because upon taking with the rook, as we talked about, the rook could take f3, and, and then uh, black would actually be winning because his bishop is the right color corner. Um, so, uh, king f4 was played, and, and, and just in time, because the rook has not improved himself yet, I'm talking about this a2 rook over here, and, and now we get to the point where um, the second weakness does start to become a little bit more clear. Black gave this check, and, and white played bishop d4, which is the only move, uh, obviously, um, and, and now black played g6, um, G5 is not possible here. Very important to note. Um, this is actually one of the critical variations because the difference between the king being on F3 and E4 is huge. After G5 check, rook takes G5, rook takes E4, king takes E4. Here we push, the bishop comes back, we push, bishop comes up, king comes up. This is actually a form of Zugzwang because if the king moves, white continues to make progress on this side of the board um, and eventually wins because this bishop is stuck to the pawn. Um, so the bishop moved to a8, and now white white had calculated that this is why the, the difference between tempos, between the king being on f3 and e4, made a huge difference because white is able to make this run to this side of the board and uh, after black goes after the h3 pawn, which he doesn't really have a choice, can't just sit and wait, um, <clears throat> the timing works out perfectly to eventually achieve um, I'm sorry actually, it was uh, takes g6, bishop d5 first I messed up the line, I was going too fast g5, king takes Actually, it was king king over bishop d5, g5, king takes, g6, king g3, g7, h3, queen, bishop takes, queen with check, with the key idea being this check on a2. Um, and, and the point of this analysis is that um, if, if the black king goes to a light square, the bishop is taken with check. 
If the black king goes to anywhere along the e-file or f1, white will now be able to take the bishop with the queen because the h1 square is vacant. And so moving to g1 becomes one of the only options, but now we repeat that little trick, queen a1 check. If the king goes to the light square, we take the bishop with check. And therefore, the only other move is king h2, because again, if he goes to f2, we take the bishop and our queen gets to h1. And now, the king is blocking the pawn. And anybody who knows how to win this endgame, um, you know, more power to you. Pretty much everyone should know that um, black will not be able to make progress here because white will check the king until the king has to hide back in front of the pawn. The king will make progress and white will rinse and repeat and uh, eventually win the endgame. So that's kind of a lot of analysis and probably something I could have let you guys think about to solve. But I just wanted to show you that... Um, Again, calculation is required to play good practical technique. Um, white, white had really no other option in this position, but White ended up playing rook c5 in the game, as I already told you, and ended up drawing. But White's only other option was to calculate and, and to see that, that, uh, that there was a difference between the tempos of where the king was and that this g5 check trick didn't work anymore. Um, again, you can pause the video and go back and review the analysis, but because I messed it up, I'm going to show you one more time. The point is that white's king is, 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 is a step closer, uh, and um, now when he makes this run and continues, continues all the way to the 8th rank to gain that tempo on the bishop, uh, black will not have enough time to get this pawn to h2. That's the point. If you were dealing with a position where this pawn was already on h2 after this queen trick, which I showed, queen, and then queen with check, followed by queen a2, if the pawn was already on the corner, this would be a drawn endgame, as most of you, you know, probably know, that the corner pawn, if it does indeed reach the second or seventh rank, white is unable to win those, unless the king is, is uh, significantly closer, at least the fifth rank generally. So, Good stuff, good stuff. Shows that uh, White was not going to be able to uh, have enough time if, if he had gone for that type of sacrifice with his king on f3. Um, but by calculation, he could have seen that the difference in tempos um, would have helped uh, tremendously. Um, so, Black didn't play g5, he played g6. And now finally, you know, once uh, our major points are out of the way, we reach this critical position where, um, despite the fact that we've done everything right, um, we activated our king to the fourth rank, uh, we didn't fall for the, the trick with rook takes f3, uh, we didn't play rook c5 and allow him to connect the pawn, so we are, we are at least holding the fifth rank for now. With all that being said, black is still in a pretty good shape. He's attacking the h3 pawn and still holding down the a pawn. We, we, we're still in this constant position of calculation. We have to calculate the fact that he can take that pawn, and, and we're frustrated by the fact that our progress is limited as long as he's holding the a pawn. So from here, I'd like to ask you again to take a think and tell me how should white proceed. Okay, we're going to assume that you did that, and uh, hopefully a lot of you guys were able to come up with exactly what the second weakness is. The second weakness is not one of these pawns, but in fact, the second weakness is Black's King. After playing g5 check, and uh, many of you may have considered this idea just for the fact that it separates the pawns, but after playing g5 check, you create what's uh, what becomes a little bit of a mating net um, for Black's King. And after he goes to the 7th rank, White continues with Rook to b7 check. And uh, after King to d8, White gets in with King e5. And surprisingly, this actually becomes very similar to one of those uh, Rook and Bishop versus Rook mates. King to d6. And again, if black plays king to e8, he chooses to get mated over on the, on the king side, followed by mate. Notice how the bishop guards the third rank, thus preventing even any ideas. Um, and the fact that black's rook was so preoccupied with the a pawn is partly why this is you know possible. Again, this is why this is a principle of two weaknesses position. If he takes the pawn, 
we're able to give check in bishop b7. Um, obviously, black has no check, so the game is over. And finally, if he plays rook to c3, which uh, is, is preparing to, to block along the 8th rank with the hopes that if I was to give check and the king was to come over, I'd be, I'd be there in time for the pawn, and, and now I have my own h-pawn. But the problem, again, is this uh, old switcheroo, which is why I think it's funny. It's, it's a very similar idea to when you have just king, rook, and bishop versus just king and rook. Um, obviously, that angle is a theoretical draw. In fact, you can see Josh, uh, Grandmaster Josh Burdell's videos here on chess.com if you want to know um, exactly how to draw those. Um, but as he talks about in those lectures, and even in my own experience, white, the, the person with the rook and bishop tends to win a lot more than people tend to draw. Um, it's actually one of the more difficult defenses if you don't know the idea. So uh, good, good to watch those videos if you have the time. Um, okay. So um, we kind of finished up a little bit faster, but the main point was that white, white had to calculate in the beginning in order to get to that position, but, but after he did so, um, the, his second weakness, what the second target was, became very clear, and that was the uh, the black king. Um, and and by, by pushing him back and creating a little bit of a mating net, um, it should be noted that it was it was not even really worth considering to go after these pawns because um, not only from a practical point of view that would you would you want to you know have one pass pawn to none or have two pass pawns, but your opponent gets one. And I think I think it's pretty clear we'd rather create keep the situation where we're the ones pushing, we're the ones with all the winning chances, rather than, you know, even inviting some sort of weird race position like this. And I probably should have mentioned that as we were going, but, um, you know, coming back to it just as effective. And I just think it's good to build that little muscle in your chess game that you, you don't allow your opponent's unnecessary chances. Um, now, instead of rook to b7 check, king to e5 was also possible right away. Um, and this allows him to take the pawn... But the difference is that after we go for this tactic to win, win the bishop, black is able to create a little counterplay of his own, winning just enough material. If we go to the, uh, to the g4 square, he's able to play rook to d5, discover check. Kind of a cute little idea because both pieces seem to be hanging, but uh, black was able to defend. And if we move away, now we head into that, you know, aforementioned king, rook, and bishop versus king and rook. Um, with good technique, white should be able to win the pawns, but again, even in that case, um, the, the end game is a theoretical draw. So I wanted to show that the immediate king to e5 was not as effective as rook to b7 check and right away. Now, if black had played king to d6, his idea was would be clear, which was to uh, avoid some of the maintenance. However, the problem there is that we're able to, we are able to give this check and improve the status of the pawn, um, and, and white should be able to go on to win this endgame um, uh, because the pawn is that much better. Um, however, uh, it may have been a better try for black. I do have it in here as a better try for black than the voluntary king d8, which sort of goes directly into our position where the king is the second weakness and the pawn was the first weakness. So the point of this lecture, again, is, is, is to see these advanced ideas where... Um, White never really focused too much on creating a second pass pawn um, per se, but he created on he focused on creating a second weakness, which turned out to be the enemy king. Combining threats against the king, um, threats to win large amounts of material, and eventually mating threats. Um, combining those threats with the power of the eight pawn ended up being enough, um, and he didn't have to go for a more of a positional advantage like a pawn on the other side of the board. So this is why we chose this example, kind of an interesting point of view on principle of two weaknesses, with the king being the second weakness. And, uh, and that's it. Um, so we have one more video coming to you on this topic from chess.com. It's our bonus video, um, but we hope you enjoyed the lecture today. And uh, again, you can pause and recap and review anything if you need to. But the main idea was, was uh, patience and finding that second weakness, which in this case turned out to be the enemy king and not the pawns. Um, and I, I think particularly... Um, instructive is, is seeing how many times white could have gone wrong. Um, everything from the, uh, you know, from not playing a5, if he doesn't calculate a5 with the rook takes e6 idea, then, you know, the game may just be very unclear right to start. So, but from not playing a5 to making sure that he didn't play what white actually played in the game, which was sliding over and allowing black this easy opportunity after check to solidify his king side creating almost not only no pawn weaknesses, but also no entry points 
because White was uh, White was able to get those attacks on the king because of his entry points into the center and through the king side. Um, so a lot of places White could have gone wrong, but with uh, with very accurate play, White was able to improve the position. White was able to improve the position and create threats against the enemy king, which ended up telling the tale um, when, when those threats were combined with the fact that Black was preoccupied with the A pawn. Um, okay, so that was a quick synopsis of uh, what, we, uh, what we did here today, and hope you enjoyed it, and see you next time on Chess.com. Thank you.